Hi, welcome to the Penguin Post newspaper broadcast. Today we are interviewing Dean Falk. He studies evolutionary anthropology. Let's ask her some questions. Why do you study evolutionary anthropology? For one reason, it's really fascinating. And I thought so ever since I learned what anthropology was and then learned what evolution was about. So I'm really lucky because as an adult, I get to make my living studying something that's absolutely fascinating. Were you interested in being a anthropologist? Apology as a kid? You know, as a kid, I didn't know what anthropology was until later. But as a kid, what I was really interested in, like when I was about your age and for quite a while after that, was outer space. Cause, you know, the, the planets, the stars, and and the question of whether or not there was life, uh, you know, in elsewhere in the universe. And what I desperately wanted more than anything in the world was to either see a UFO or even better to see an alien. So I was interested in nature, but I didn't become interested in humans, the evolution of humans until later, actually until college. And, and then it happened because I, I took a course from a wonderful teacher. He was a zoologist, Carmen. So he was interested in animals too, as you are. And he was really, really an interesting teacher. And I thought, wow, this stuff's fascinating. And so that was the turning point for me in terms of eventually becoming an anthropologist. What is the most difficult part of your job? Hmm. Good question. Um, you know, all of it's challenging. In doing research is challenging, um, not in a bad way, but sometimes finding the resources in terms of articles from the library, um, that kind of thing can be, can be difficult. In my field, I study fossils quite a bit. And it can at times be difficult to get permission from museums or for, from the discoverers of those fossils to get permission to see them and study them. Um, so I guess that's a potential difficulty. I was looking at your website and I saw you study Albert Einstein's brain. That, that's so cool. How is uh, um, Albert Einstein brain different than other people's? Well, thank you for that question. It is different. And let me just tell you that this, you know, I got to study it sort of by accident. And most of the things that I've studied have been associated with happy accidents. And in this case, a person at a, a church here called the Unitarian Church asked me if I would go to a book group they were having. They were talking about a brain, which was a biography of Albert Einstein. And he wanted me to tell them what was known about Einstein's brain. And um, so I went to find out and I realized not much. And that started my interest. And uh, I was really, really lucky to be able to. And, and what happened was I learned through reading the little bit that had been done, that there were some missing photographs of all aspects of Einstein's brain, clear around the top, the bottom, if you cut it down the middle, the inside. And that's the sort of thing I study in fossils, these outside parts of the brain. So I started to try and find these missing pictures. And with the help of somebody else who was very interested in Einstein, a doctor named Fred Lepore. Um, we, or he actually was able to find them. They were hidden away in someone's basement. And he persuaded 
them to make them available to science. So we got to really study in detail the surface. It's called the cerebral cortex of Einstein's brain. So what's unusual is not the size, because Einstein's brain was absolutely normal in size. For a man of his age, uh, it was just totally normal. But what was unusual were the configurations of the bumps and the grooves on the outside of the brain, and that's called the cerebral cortex. And that's where you do your higher thinking. Believe it or not, it's on the outside of your brain. And Einstein's um, brain was very convoluted, it had a lot of um, uh, surface area, it had, it had parts that were expanded kind of all over the surface. And there were some differences between the right side and the left side, which were unusual. And we have differences between the right and the left sides of our brains. Um, your language is mostly a function of the left side of your brain. So right now, as I'm talking, I'm generating it from right here in my brain. And um, as I listen to you guys, actually, I'm, uh, I'm comprehending what you're saying a little bit further back on the left side of the brain. The right side's more musical and a little bit more emotional and intuitive. So Einstein really had interesting right-left differences and interesting features in each lobe of the brain. So it was uh, extra connected across the right and left sides, really big fiber connections. So his brain was complicated, it's wiring, and well connected between the two halves. And he did things. I don't know if any of you um, play musical instruments. Do any of you? Anybody taking piano lessons or playing an instrument? No? No? Well, you might take it up. <laughs> Einstein played the violin and the piano as he was, when he was a child. And as an adult, he would, if he was stuck on a physics problem, go into his kitchen and pick up his violin and start playing it. And then sometimes he would, while he was playing music, just getting into the music, he would suddenly get the answer to a problem, a physics problem that had been bothering him. As I said, the right and left sides of his brain were well connected. Why aren't there m many women intelligent robotics? <laughs> That's a good question. Why aren't there many women in paleoanthropology? Paleo means old, and anthropology means a study of humans. Um, and by paleoanthropology, we mean like our ancestors. People commonly call them cavemen, or even earlier, there are even earlier ones. Um, it's been traditionally a man's field, although today there are way more women than there were even three decades ago. Um, well, for the same reason, I guess, that many disciplines don't have as, as many women. Um, there were biases against women studying sciences at one point. Now I'm happy to think that probably that's not true with your generation, that you, under, you know that you can um, be a scientist if you want to be a scientist. So there, um, you know, men were kind of privileged in terms of being encouraged to pursue their interest. And then in getting the resources that you need, you need, you know, grant support, access to specimens, that kind of thing. So happily, things are changing. and We've got some great, you know, female paleoanthropologists. Meev Leakey comes to mind. She's part of this leaky family that live in, in Kenya that have been longtime giants in the field of paleoanthropology. And before her, her mother-in-law, her late mother-in-law, Mary Leakey, was an archaeologist who really opened up East Africa for study of 
of archaeology, you know, the tools that our ancestors made. And then also um, Mary Leakey found the first kind of old human ancestor or he, early human relative in, uh, in East Africa. So it's better now. How has our brain changed over time? Ooh, that's a big question. So in terms of human brains, you know, at one point our ancestors lived in trees and, um, and they were apes. And millions of years ago, some of them shifted to living on the ground and started walking on two legs, as we do. Or it took a while to actually walk as smoothly on the ground as we do, but they started the trend and it became refined over time. Because of walking on two legs, everything changed. All the anatomy, the um, coordination of movement, the parts of the brain that do that changed. And that just set everything off in new directions. And one of the things that was related to that eventually was that um, language emerged. So we humans are unusual uh, compared to all other animals in that we have symbolic complicated language. Sure, other animals vocalize and they mean things when they vocalize and some even have some calls that mean specific things but only humans take little bits of air and spit them out of their mouth and complex sequences that have symbolic meanings and, and these words can be rearranged to express an infinite number of ideas so i think the major change in our brain that led to all the other changes was that our ancestors became linguistic. They got language and that changed the wiring of the brain. And in, in a really complicated way, we have um, very complicated, vast connections in the brain that function during language. And then later evolution or mother nature, however you think of it, picked up on these language networks and other advanced cognitive things evolved, like mathematics, um, mus uh, musical abilities, you know, high level musical abilities, really relatively recently, uh, as in three, four, 5,000 years ago, we have reading that's just so recent. But again, it picks up and uses these networks that first evolved because of language. So we are different. We humans, we have big brains for our body sizes. I mean, our brains aren't as big as an elephant's brain, but uh, we're much smaller body than an elephant. So relative to body size, we have really big brains. And then we have very com um, complex wiring for language. And then another thing that's unusual is that, and this is associated with those right left differences I mentioned earlier. We're very lopsided in function in our brain, but as a species, we became largely right handed. And the side of the brain that this is my right hand, it doesn't look like it in there, but this is my right hand. And my right hand is controlled by the opposite side of the brain. And it's an area right next to speech areas. And so the two kind of evolved together, this right hand in it. So that's another way we're different. So humans, you know, you can take a chimpanzee, say, who's our closest ape relative, and um, send it to college and teach it sign language or some other kind of symbolic language, maybe with computers. And that ape, that chimpanzee, will get very, will acquire very simple, simple, basic language skills. But nothing like a human baby, 
you know, infant will uh, acquire by the time it's a couple of years old. But a difference between the little tiny human baby who's very ape-like in its language initially and the language educated ape is that that baby will, when it's not too old, when it's still an infant, will one day look at its parents or a parent or somebody else and say, where did I come from? And so humans ask questions. They're curious. I've never read of a great ape that has language asking a question out of curiosity, ever. So, you know, we're curious. We have an intellectual curiosity. We saw that you work with your granddaughter. That's awesome. How did your granddaughter get interested in family and paleoanthropology? Paleoanthropology, old anthropology. Um, okay, well, my granddaughter is named Eve, and she's a young woman now. And her interest is more in the writing aspect, I think, than so much in human evolution. Um, Eve has something called Asperger's syndrome. Have you heard of it? Maybe you haven't. It's a form of autism. And, it's, um, and autism is, uh, exists in a wide range of varieties. And she's on the so-called high end of the spectrum. So Eve has this condition, Asperger's syndrome, and they're kind of nicknamed Aspies. That's a friendly nickname. And uh, people who have this condition lack basic social skills that come naturally to other folks. They have to be taught things like, how, what does a smile mean? I mean, we just learned it spontaneously as we develop. But somebody with this condition doesn't intuit social stuff. However, uh, they're often really fascinated with subjects, particular subjects, and uh, with one or two that they themselves are really interested in. And they become, it's called little professor syndrome because they become quite knowledgeable about whatever it is they're interested in. It could be butterflies, or it could be typewriters, or ceiling fans. Um, and in Eve's case, she is interested in fantasy fiction, and anime, and... Um, uh, Japanese comic strips and all things Japanese. So she was a voracious reader from a really early age. And this is pretty um, typical of a number of people with Asperger's. So when Evie was born, I knew her as a brand new baby. And it became clear as she grew up that she was unusual. And back then, you know, she's 28 now. So back then, the condition was barely known. It was known, but it wasn't known the way it is today. But it became clear eventually that she had this thing called Asperger's syndrome. So I, some, as somebody who was interested in the brain and thinking, learned as much as I could about it. And then there came a point where I talked to her about it and asked her questions about it. And then it was like, well, let's do a book on this. And in the book we did together, I have the boring chapters. Okay, I have that like nerdy science chapters, but each one ends with a little kind of essay that Evie wrote about her experience as somebody with this condition. So that's how Eve and I um, wrote this book together. That was awesome. Thank you for your time. Bye. Well, I want to congratulate you guys on having the Penguin Post. I just think it's wonderful that you're doing this. And thank you for letting me come talk to you. I've really enjoyed it. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Have a good day. Stay safe. Wear those masks when you go out in the world. Wash your hands.